It's wonderful to see uh, so many old friends here for what is uh, one of the major events of the year, of course, uh, for the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. Um, as a s former student of Reischauer, it makes, gives me particular pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today for the uh, Reischauer Memorial Lecture, someone that I think fits very uh, closely to the ideal that Reischauer himself is both an academic and a, uh, a part-time statesman felt uh, was important for America's relations with Asia. Somebody who has a deep understanding of Japan, of course our speaker Danny Russell uh, today um, did start his career, well I don't know if he started his career in Japan, but he spent uh, significant time across uh, that long and distinguished career in Japan. He was uh, Consul General in Nagoya first, then he was Consul General in, um, in um, uh, Osaka, and then he was head of the Japan desk. And then, of course, he went on to uh, much broader concerns in regional affairs that I think also mirror one of Reischauer's own personal concerns uh, from the very days of his PhD thesis, which was about a, a, a Japanese monk, Enin, who voyaged broadly to China, Korea, around different parts of Asia. Um, he always felt that together with a strong U.S.-Japan relationship, it was important to see Japan uh, in the broader context of Asia as a whole. And our speaker served uh, after his time as head of the Japan desk, first on the National Security Council as senior director for East Asia and the Pacific uh, for President Obama. And then from July 2013, also as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Currently, he's serving as Vice President for International Security and Diplomacy at uh, the Asia Society's Policy uh, Institute and has been a, a real agenda setter on broad issues of Pacific policy in uh, that context as well. Um, so, for quite some time, it seemed to me that a perfect uh, 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 lecturer for the uh, Reichar Memorial Lecture Series would be Danny Russell. I recall that I, I asked him about this originally, I think, um, while he was serving just before he left the administration, and he graciously agreed to do it. And I'm delighted that at last we've been able to do this. So uh, today, He's going to be speaking on the U.S.-Japan alliance and America first, coping with changing the Indo-Pacific. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Danny Russell. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'm not going to say it's a pleasure to be in, back in Washington, but it's a pleasure to be back at SAIS and to see all you. And it's a special thrill to see some former bosses and a lot of former colleagues from the Department of State from the, well, the good old days, I think we can uh, confidently call them. Um, and speaking of friends and speaking of the good old days, um, I had the honor of working very closely with a very good friend, a successor, and a close contemporary of Edwin Reischauer, Ambassador Mike Mansfield, or Private Mike Mansfield, as he chose to be memorialized. Uh, it was my first assignment, in fact, in the Foreign Service. And um, a further honor was that as an absolutely brand new Foreign Service officer, uh, miraculously assigned to Tokyo uh, for my first post, and even more miraculously assigned as uh, Mansfield's uh, staff aide. Uh, within the first two months or so after I arrived in 1985, 
Uh, I had the incredible honor of being included in a dinner that Ambassador Mansfield hosted for, uh, for Ambassador Reischauer and, and Haru Reischauer. Um, so obviously there's no better way for me to begin my remarks today uh, than to share with you the far-reaching, uh, deeply erudite, thoughtful, insightful, profound conversation uh, between these two titans of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, I think you see where this is going. <laughs> it would be great. It would have been great, unfortunately. Um, all that I can really remember about the dinner was being paralyzingly uh, awestruck at the you know exalted company and the elegant surroundings, the glittering silver, the you know sparkling crystal and all that kind of stuff. And particularly the huge challenge for me as an aspiring uh, and ambitious diplomat of figuring out which were the right forks and spoons and glasses to use at any particular juncture uh, in the dinner, so the net result is that I don't remember a single word that was exchanged in the entire <laughs> dinner. Um, that's embarrassing, but uh, notwithstanding that lapse, the convictions that guided Reischauer and Mansfield about the value of the U.S.-China relation, uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship, and the importance of genuine mutual understanding had an immense impact on me personally and professionally that uh, continues uh, to this day. They were both really inspiring but unpretentious role models, uh, showing respect for others, uh, cherishing their life partners, combining loyalty, candor, even constructive dissent in public service. And I don't have to persuade this audience, I think, how precious those qualities are at this juncture in our nation's development. The Reischauer wrote f persuasively in his famous The Broken Dialogue article of our unspoken assumptions about one another that serve as barriers to real understanding. And to his immense credit as ambassador, he actively reached out uh, to all segments of Japanese society um, both to listen, um, but also to speak honestly. And both Mansfield and Reischauer had the rare talent for listening. I can still, and I'm probably not the only one in this room, who can still hear Ambassador Mansfield's voice in my head uh, saying, Dan, you know, puffing on his pipe, always listen to the other guy. Who knows? Maybe he's right. <laughs> and they both fit that wonderful Will Rogers definition of, uh, of a diplomat as someone who can tell you to go to hell in a way that makes you look forward to the trip. <laughs> and they did it not through flattery, not through oratory, but by being honest and direct and sincere. And let me see if I can do justice to those two mentors by being honest, direct, and sincere with you. Because now, it feels like it's the world that's going to hell. And I don't think any of us uh, are going to enjoy that trip. I'm not just talking about the daunting list of hot spots and issues and challenges facing Japan and the alliance and the world. Uh, and I'll get to those in a moment. Um, but I'm talking about the fact that the United States and China are careening towards a toxic form of strategic rivalry that seriously threatens the stability and the prosperity of uh, not only the Asia-Pacific region, but of the world. And the broken dialogue today now is between Washington and Beijing. Uh, the trade war, the tech war, the influence war, the visa war, the supply chain war, decoupling, all of these carry immense risk to all parties, particularly those like Japan, who have important ties to both countries. On the one hand, we've got China's rapid growth along multiple lines of national power combined with an unprecedented pattern of increasingly assertive behavior. On the other hand, 
We have a shift in Washington's priorities and Washington's behavior under the America First doctrine that has called into question its commitment to the region, its commitment to long-standing values, and by extension, called into question the viability of the liberal international order. This is a double punch, and it's unleashing immense anxieties, particularly in the Asia-Pacific Asia region, but in South Asia and Europe as well. And it's helping to drive a process of adaptation and of uh, readjustment, realignment, that looks like it will lead to consequential, long-lasting changes, and changes that are quite worrisome from the perspective of universal rights, of norms, universal or international law. So against that backdrop, I want to look at two questions in particular. One is, how is the US-Japan relationship doing? And the other is, what is Japan doing in the Indo-Pacific region in particular to kind of hold things together, at least while the US is AWOL? I want to begin, though, by saying how proud I am to have been at least a part of the bipartisan effort to strengthen the foundation of the U.S.-Japan relationship, uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance, first in the Bush administration and then during the eight years of uh, Obama. Regarding the rebalance to Asia, you could say that it began with the first visit of the first foreign leader to the Oval Office to greet the new president Obama less than a month after his inauguration. And that happened to be, not by chance, the Japanese Prime Minister, then uh, Prime Minister Taro Aso. From that point forward, I think that the Obama administration demonstrated that the, the first pillar of its rebalance strategy was strengthening and modernizing America's alliances. And Japan was, as the saying goes, the cornerstone of that effort. But I think our contribution also included, frankly, just holding it together during the turbulence of the DPJ's Hatoyama uh, government. The, remember, isosceles triangle of equidistant relations between Tokyo and Washington, Tokyo and Beijing, some irresponsible statements about moving the marine bases out of Okinawa, out of Japan. And holding it together also through the Nejire Kokkai, the, the uh, revolving door years of Aso, Hato, Kan, Noda, Abe, five prime ministers in five years for Obama. That was a lot of first dates. That was a lot of starting over from scratch. A lot of, yeah, by all means, call me Barack. <laughs> um, but we worked through that, and we worked through the tragedy of 311, uh, the tragedy that produced Operation Tomodachi, uh, worked through the challenge, the extreme challenge of the Fukushima Daiichi reactor meltdown that put our relationship and our alliance to a critical test. And we decisively strengthened U.S.-Japan relations through the powerful demonstrations of reconciliation that marked the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Prime Minister Abe's 2015 state visit and his landmark address to a joint meeting of Congress. Uh, Obama's historic visit to Hiroshima. And then the following spring, their very powerful joint visit to uh, Pearl Harbor. And beyond these dramatic and extraordinary milestones, beyond the shared investment in reconciliation, our two countries made immense progress on a range of substantive issues, the Joint Defense Guidelines, TPP, unprecedented cooperation, trilateral cooperation with South Korea, enabled by the 2015 Comfort Woman Agreement and the 2016 Jisomia Agreement. Sigh. You know, on that subject, it's worth remembering that Reichauer himself considered his 
greatest achievement as ambassador uh, to have facilitated the normalization of relations between Japan and Korea. So these things I mentioned as well as some of the subsequent areas of progress made in the current administration on the security side have all enhanced the resilience of the alliance and improved its capacity to deal with a lot of the formidable challenges facing us today and in the coming decade. I'd point out also that the alliance really benefited quite a bit from some important steps taken over the last few years by the Japanese government itself. The creation of the National Security Council, led so ably for the first five and a half years by Shotaro Yachi. The launching of Japan's National Security Strategy, which uh, began the process of presenting coherent and coordinated sets of priorities. The reinterpretation of the Constitution to allow for a limited right of collective self-defense. The security legislation that enabled expanded overseas deployment uh, by the self-defense forces. And the adoption of the Official Secret Act that protects Japan's classified information, but also allowed the United States to share more classified information uh, with Japan. So these are measures that I think incalculably improved and expanded our ability to work together on security issues and on other strategic issues. But it's not all security in the US-Japan partnership. We shouldn't overlook the fact that the US and Japan have a lot more than a military alliance. Broadly speaking, we have a, a political alliance and an economic alliance in, in most respects. On the economic front, it's true that the current administration's threat and use of tariffs against Japan has created considerable resentment. But despite that, the two governments did ultimately manage to resurrect uh, many of the, or most of the agricultural provisions uh, from the TPP in their recent bilateral trade deal. And much more significantly, they reached an agreement on a digital trade deal that marks a very important step in setting high standard open internet rules. That's a good thing. Trump became the first head of state to meet with the new emperor in the Daewa era. That's a good thing. Today, there is uh, continued strong public support in the two countries for the alliance and continued positive public attitudes towards the other nation. That's a good thing. Even though it's true that the Pew annual surveys show that Japanese confidence in the US president has plummeted from 78% in 2016 to 30% in the most recent poll that I've seen. And of course, it's widely perceived that Prime Minister Abe has pretty deftly avoided many of the pitfalls that, uh, in dealing with Donald Trump, that have uh, bedeviled other leaders and have deflected a number of potential threats to Japan's interests, albeit not without some cost, I'm sure, to his dignity. Um, now, it remains to be seen how Prime Minister Abe's skill in damage control is going to fare in the upcoming uh, battle over host nation support. And judging by press reports that the administration's opening bid is something like a five-fold increase, which for some reason sounds a lot more like my New York landlord, um, maybe the Tokyo Olympics aren't the only game that people are going to be watching closely next year. But that said, overall, I think that an objective assessment of the U.S.-Japan alliance, the U.S.-Japan partnership shows that there are points of tension, there are some high hurdles to cross, but it remains very resilient, uh, multifaceted, and with deep, deep roots. That, that resilience comes from a number of important attributes in the partnership and enhances its effectiveness that it's become steadily stronger and more balanced in key respects, which is something that Edwin Reichauer devoutly hoped for. 
And lastly, that there are powerful geostrategic imperatives, such as obviously the behavior and the rise of China, that increase our reliance on, on one another. So speaking of China, um, let me turn to the question of what sorts of challenges the US-Japan partnership is up against. Uh, without, before I get into the China question, I want to begin by ensuring that we all remember uh, the impact of the fact that we're operating in a environment of strategic uncertainty. And one factor in that is the advent of disruptive technologies and other trends. Um, the revolution in robotics and information and communication, transport, energy, automation, biotech, artificial intelligence. You know, these are upending many of the familiar aspects of the social order, the economic, political, security order in both of our countries. And added to that, we ha are contending with the downstream effects of globalization, such as climate change, extreme weather, pandemics. All of these things create new vulnerabilities. There is the destabilizing impact of non-state actors uh, across a broad spectrum. Um, not just the bad ones, not just terrorist groups, but non-governmental movements uh, and organizations and huge multinational firms that operate almost without a home across borders. Uh, and then a growing list of cyber threats. Uh, speaking of which, there's North Korea uh, still under uh, emboldened Kim Jong-un, expanding an arsenal of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, ballistic missiles with impunity. So there's a long list, okay, but we, we can talk a little bit about China. First and foremost, there's the trade war. That is a serious threat to Asian economies. The ADB, the World Bank, have already lowered their growth forecasts for the region. But more broadly, there's the behavior of a China that has departed from the orthodoxy of the Deng Xiaoping hide and bide. A China that's working overtly to uh, build a position of decisive regional influence for itself that has demonstrated an inclination under Xi Jinping to use its growing power to undercut accepted rules and to coerce uh, other countries. Now, you know, cataloging the impact of Chinese behavior and Chinese policies on the region is an entire speech in itself. And I don't want the issue of China's rise to sort of crowd out the rest of the discussion, so I'll restrain myself. And Washington's a town of lawyers, so do like the lawyers do and just stipulate that there are a litany of concerns about Chinese practices. And you know, if you want more details, go read a Mike Pence uh, or a Mike Pompeo speech. My point here is just that when it comes to China, that its growth and behavior are driving significant geostrategic and geoeconomic changes in the region, number one. And then secondly, it, those changes are particularly dramatic because they come at a time that combines them with the sort of bewildering phenomenon of Donald Trump. The shift in direction that is, at least as I travel in Asia and other parts of the world, universally perceived as a weakening of the U.S. commitment to historic values uh, and to the Asia-Pacific region itself. It's as if the U.S. approach to the region suddenly shifted from rebalance to unbalance. And let's face it, America first just isn't really a banner that other countries can readily rally around. It's not a recipe for united action. My Asian friends say that the withdrawal from TPP, from the Paris Climate Agreement, from the Iran deal, even from the INF uh, treaty with Russia, have all taken a toll on U.S. credibility. 
So has skipping the East Asia summit. So does deriding allies as free riders and as the commander in chief talking cavalierly about withdrawing US troops from the region because as he put it, Asia is not our neighborhood. So if the leader is tweeting and acting on America first, you got to ask how seriously will other countries take FOIP, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, there is a lot to like in FOIP, it's other than the acronym. Um, in fact, for somebody like me who was so deeply involved in the rebalance, there's an awful lot that's very familiar uh, in the US Indo-Pacific strategy. But the fact remains that it's really hard to square uh, Trump's message and Trump's behavior with the strategy. And as a result, there are pretty serious doubts in the region about FOIP implementation. And there are also widespread reservations about um, what's perceived as a very heavy anti-China slant to the initiative. So at a time when the region is being buffeted by all these trends that I've mentioned, there is an extraordinary value in the ability and in the willingness of Japan as a stable and respected democracy to sustain uh, and to expand its engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. For starters, Japan is perceived in regional surveys around uh, year after year as trustworthy and as consistent. You know, you look at something like the Lowy Institute's uh, Global Power Index, the study of the relative power of 25 countries in Asia, it identifies Japan as the region's top overachiever, <laughs> a quintessential smart power. And under the Abe government, the original author of the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative, um, we have seen a real surge in Japan's activism in regional diplomacy. Abe famously visited all 10 Southeast Asian ASEAN countries in his first year back in office. He's made it uh, his business to attend uh, every APEC meeting and every ASEAN summit. Japan has put special emphasis on ASEAN given its centrality to the regional architecture and uh, its function as the hinge connecting the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, Abe still maintains a pretty high tempo of foreign travel and he regularly hosts foreign leaders individually and collectively in a variety of different combinations. Just the past year, of course, he hosted the G7 in Tokyo, the G20 in Osaka, but other groups uh, that don't get as much support and attention uh, as they warrant. Uh, the, Mekong, the five Mekong uh, leaders, uh, the Pacific Island uh, leaders as well. And when Xi Jinping visits Tokyo for the cherry blossom uh, season, uh, late March or early April this, as expected in this coming year, um, you know, the, the preponderance of leaders from the Indo-Pacific, with the obvious exception of Kim Jong-un, uh, will have been hosted in, in Japan as well. Beyond that, in, it, you know, in these meetings uh, and in public, Japan has been a strong, articulate advocate for a free, open, inclusive, and rules-based region. Um, that's included a heavy emphasis on international law, although admittedly, um, less than one might like on human rights. But nevertheless, Japan has a lot of credibility as a proponent of international law and universal norms and values. In terms of regional security, Japan provides and has expanded important forms of support throughout uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. You know, that includes contributions to regional coast guards, to developing maritime domain awareness. Uh, it includes training programs that build practical skills and technical capacity. 
And based on my own experience, um, I think one of the reasons that Japan can be quite effective is that so much of the work is conducted collaboratively by multiple uh, ministries and agencies, and often done in cooperation with Japanese NGOs as well. Uh, with respect to the self-defense force, uh, we see them significantly increasing joint exercises and joint training with regional partners conducting naval drills in the South China Sea, for example. And that's matched with an uptick in Japan's defense diplomacy, um, including things like port calls and uh, defense exchange programs, um, combined with security assistance, particularly in many of the littoral coastal states. We see the Japan-Australia defense relationship shaping up to be the backbone of a durable security network that augments the alliances that each of the two countries have with the United States. And at the same time, defense cooperation with India is expanding, including through international uh, institutionalizing dialogues. Um, a two plus two meeting is scheduled uh, the middle of next month. And there are things like the Malabar and other joint exercises, and as with Australia, an uptick in defense technology and defense industry cooperation with other countries. Then there's the economic sphere. Um, particularly given the rise of protectionism, um, there's a broad recognition that Japan's activism in trade and investment liberalization is of real value. I mean, you don't need me to tell you the story of Japan's leadership in salvaging uh, the, the TPP-11 from the wreckage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Another part of that is taking the initiative in multilateral institutions like the important digital economy initiative at the Osaka G20, the data free flow with trust. Advocacy to, for open markets and efforts to promote improvement in the multilateral trading system are very important, but beyond that, Japan is putting its markets where its mouth is. Um, it now has something like 14 FTAs or EPAs, economic partnership agreements in the region, and that's not even counting TBP-11 and not even counting uh, the RCEP agreement. There's also valuable innovation taking place in Japan in sectors like healthcare, uh, turning its graying population into an asset because the lessons Japan is learning about supporting silver populations and the products and the technology that it's developing for them, these are things that are, of course, applicable for the rest of the world. And much of what Japan is contributing in the region comes from its substantial FDI investments, um, heavy flows of investment in the region, continuing on an upward trend, particularly in manufacturing and in service sectors. Many people are surprised to learn that the overall stock of Japan's FDI in the region is bigger than that of China. And similarly, Japan is a very large source of development assistance, ODA, throughout the Indo-Pacific. On top of that, um, you've got initiatives that promote people-to-people -people and educational exchanges. JICA just uh, has launched in the last two years, I think, a scholarship program to bring to Japan for graduate level training in English something like 2,000 uh, young civil servants from developing countries, mostly from the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific region. And then there's infrastructure. Japan launched the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure Initiative that comes with some $200 billion in funding for investments and brings to it a positive reputation for both efficiency on the one hand and high standards on the other. Uh, there's also a Eurasia Connectivity Cooperation Plan that Japan signed just a few months ago with the EU that's backed with a separate $65 billion fund. You know, you have to, we'll have to see what this and other initiatives produces on the ground in reality in terms of transportation, energy, other projects. But it's another 
set of collaborative infrastructure initiatives from Tokyo on top of those that it is developing with Australia and uh, the US. And you know, it goes to the heart of the truism that you can't beat something with nothing. As of this year, I think Japan's current infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia are valued at over $320 billion. In contrast to China's investment of about $250 billion in the region, you know, notwithstanding all the hype surrounding uh, BRI, the Belt and Road. Now, I don't want to put everything in terms of competition with China, but when I was doing research on the Belt and Road Initiative in Asia, I, I couldn't help noticing that something like 17 of China's major infrastructure projects in the region with a cumulative value of something on the order of 44, 45 billion dollars are s suspended or in some cases have been canceled outright due to uh, various problems. Well, my intent here is not to give a cheerleading speech for the government of Japan. That's what the Gaima Show is here for. Um, but by the same token, you know, objectively assessing the nature and the extent of Japan's contribution to the regional order is something I think that's fully consistent with uh, Reichauer's own approach to issues. So by, for me, by pointing out that Japan has done a lot to fill the leadership vacuum, I'm not for a minute suggesting that Japan is big enough or strong enough or rich enough to single-handedly keep alive you know, the flame of democratic uh, and free market principles in Asia, uh, especially while the US is on apparently an extended leave of absence. And by cataloging the strengths of the US-Japan alliance and the US-Japan partnership, I'm not for a minute suggesting that the partnership wouldn't be badly damaged if the US took uh, some ill-advised steps, like accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapons state, like moving in the direction of withdrawing US forces from the region. Even going forward and imposing uh, national security derived tariffs on autos and auto parts. And I certainly don't mean to downplay some of the serious inhibiting factors uh, that undermine Japan's leadership. Its own economic slowdown, its own complicated and difficult relationship with China, and for me, very importantly, uh, the downside risks from the current uh, deterioration of Japan's relationship with South Korea. But my bigger point is that Edwin Reischauer's faith in Japan has been vindicated. When he served in Japan at a time of tremendous American idealism and multilateralism, he advocated passionately for Japan to take initiative and take responsibility in the international arena. And he could foresee Japan's potential for exerting a positive influence and a significant influence on world affairs. Today, in a period of great turbulence, Japan serves as something of a sea anchor for the values and the policies that the US has traditionally championed. It acts now as a prime mover in assembling trade networks, strengthening multilateral institutions, promoting security and development cooperation, investing in infrastructure, driving diplomatic engagement, championing the rule of law. Japan has been filling vital gaps left by attenuated American engagement in the region and Washington's shift to a more transactional approach to international relations with an approach that Bill Burns wrote was hollowing out the idea of America. And there's considerable irony in the fact that whereas it was a crisis in the US-Japan relationship 
that prompted Reischauer to write his Broken Dialogue article 60 years ago, the article that led to his diplomatic appointment. Today, it's America's standing in the region that's in crisis, and it's Japan that is stepping up. Now, I firmly and passionately believe that the US will, in due course, recover a more traditional, engaged, and values-based approach to the region. But I am painfully aware of the fact that when that happens, even under the most internationally minded future President of the United States, there isn't going to just be a snap back to Pax Americana. Um, the countries in the world and in the region are not easily going to shake their uncertainty about American dependability and American commitment. But by tending the garden, as George Schultz liked to say, by tending the garden of regional diplomacy and institutions in the ways that I've described, I think Japan is helping to ensure that uh, this gap in an otherwise long stretch of American leadership isn't simply filled by an alternative approach that will lock in a illiberal or order uh, potentially for generations to come. So Edwin Reischauer and Mike Mansfield would agree. I will stop there. Thank you very much. I have to say, um, I found that really uh, eloquent and moving, uh, especially what you had to say that the faith of, Re of, um, of Reichar in Japan was vindicated, and of course of Mansfield too. Um, of course, we have people with a variety of perspectives and a variety of interests here, uh, and certainly across Asia, for a long time there's been a view of Japan that was somewhat different, a, f a fear of where Japan uh, conceivably might, might be headed. And uh, you pointed to all the constructive things that uh, Japan has done in terms of it, uh, a region, building regional infrastructure and so on. Under what sorts of circumstances do you think Japan could uh, turn from, depart from uh, that constructive course. That's the fear of, of course, of a lot of Asia. Uh, well, you may very well be right, Kent. Um, my impression. I wasn't saying that it will happen. <laughs> I'm just wondering what kinds of scenarios or dangers of a transformation, uh, under what kind of conditions might Japan's role change? Yeah. I mean, my observation particularly in the period uh, when I was working for Obama, and particularly in the Obama's second term, so from 2012 on, uh, was that the concerted Chinese effort to uh, pump up the specter of Japanese remilitarization, you know, the, the tramp of, you know, imperialist boots on the street in Tokyo is coming, be, be afraid, you know, beware, which was a significant component of propaganda. Mm -hmm. that, that didn't have nearly the resonance uh, that many may have expected and may have sought. Uh, mm -hmm. South Korea is to some extent a special case, but broadly speaking, um, I didn't see, as I engaged in the broader Asia Pacific region, much pickup uh, from that. And I think that's part of the reason that uh, as the anniversaries of World War II approached, that mm -hmm. the Chinese gradually dialed, dialed it down because it didn't have quite the resonance in the region that it wanted. So mm -hmm. that makes me slow to anticipate that uh, we will see a, a resurgence of the kind of fearfulness of uh, Japan that looks more like uh, 
Japan in the 1930s than in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, can't rule it out. I think the fact that Prime Minister Abe, who unmistakably, by his own words and certainly by his actions and body language, uh, would like to push uh, quite hard and fast on constitutional revision, has in the face of broad Japanese public uh, opinion uh, mm -hmm. s slowed this down and downsized, right-sized his goals and objectives to a modest amendment that would uh, sort of bring the reality of the Japan self-defense force into alignment with the Constitution, that the, mm -hmm. the scale and scope of Japan's ambitions in terms of constitutional reform mm -hmm. just don't track with the caricature of mm -hmm. uh, rearming, remilitarizing Japan. Just one, to, uh, one last point to be a devil's advocate. Supposing the United States concluded a nuclear agreement with North Korea that involved dealing with long-range long missiles uh, that conceivably could threaten the United States but didn't deal with the intermediate uh, range and some of the things that threatened Japan. Do you think that could encourage Japan on another course? Absolutely. Uh, and unfortunately, Japan wouldn't be alone. Um, if the United States uh, followed down the path that which it's uh, taken the unnerving first step of uh, differentiating between something that poses a existential threat to the U.S. mainland mm -hmm. and equal threats to America's uh, treaty allies. Uh, and moreover, if the U.S. compounds that, as it has, with a uh, willingness to ignore or jettison international law in the form of UN Security Council resolutions and mm -hmm. say, well, he's not threatening me and he was nice to me, so mm. you're on your own, buddy, mm. which some would say is a, sort of the natural landing place of a American first policy, mm -hmm. then absolutely it will change the Japanese security calculus. First, it will change the South Korean security calculus. And I, for one, cannot envisage a, f a scenario in which there is a nuclear North Korea and a nuclear South Korea, but not a nuclear Japan. Mm. Or, for that matter, perhaps a nuclear Taiwan, a nuclear mm -hmm. Vietnam, a nuclear Indonesia. Well, so we got big problems if we go That's down an that interesting road. point to broaden this discussion. I know we have a lot, a lot of specialists here and people with a deep interest in where East Asia's headed, who'd like to start out? We have uh, basically what we're thinking of is perhaps 15, 20 minutes of questions, and then um, I know there's people who'd like to meet you directly, a lot of old friends and so on, and we'll have a little coffee and small refreshments in the next room. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, yes, sir. If people could identify themselves also. You know, Bill Brooks from SAIS. Uh, uh, thank you for your very stimulating talk and the comprehensive uh, approach to the region. Uh, I'd like to uh, just take one issue of China and extrapolate a little bit. Uh, the uh, relationship between the U.S. and, and uh, China, of course, is, is you know on a, on a collision course. That's a very familiar theme and, and very worrisome. But recent years, Japan seems to be uh, moving in a different direction. Uh, if you want to say it this way, uh, with the U.S., it's China out. With Japan now, it seems to be China in, starting with summer tree and then moving down. Do you think uh, that there, this seeming divergence uh, will uh, ultimately lead to some kind of uh, uh, problem between the U.S. and Japan? Great question. Um, just for the benefit of the audience as a seasoned speaker, I'd let you know that um, Stimulating means I violently disagree with you, and comprehensive means you talked too long and it was boring. But other than that, no, I'm just teasing. Great question. Um, I think that what we see in Japan's shifting 
uh, the character of Japan's engagement with China, with the caveat that it's not 100% Japan's doing. Some of this is, is part of a Chinese effort to exploit opportunities and to um, woo away uh, America's allies, at least to some degree, is a, f is a trend, is a phenomenon uh, that's very visible throughout uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And I, w I dis would describe it as a process of adaptation. It is, to some degree, a coping mechanism, or put more simply, hedging, uh, because China is a force to be reckoned with. And on top of that, I detect uh, declining confidence on the part of third countries in America's strategy and America's capacity to effectively manage the China issue or the U.S.-China uh, rivalry in a way that doesn't damage and disrupt uh, the third country interests. And what I think I see, what I worry that I see on the part of Japan, Australia, and other important U.S. partners is a steady divesting of dependence on the U.S., a diversification, mm -hmm. uh, not just of supply chains, but of political and other security relationships uh, to try to safeguard uh, their own interests and their collective interests. So there is a certain amount of kind of middle power collaboration. And you know, look no further than CPTPP, TPP 11, uh, because there is now a collaborative trade block of you know, very significant economies, uh, Japan being the largest, in the Asia-Pacific region that has found a way to operate on the basis of cutting edge, high quality standards that does not include either China or the United States. I think in the proliferation of uh, Japan, Australia, Japan, ASEAN, Japan, India, um, security and defense activities, um, we're also seeing a kind of divestment there. Um, and lastly, finding an accommodating Middle, middle zone, a sweet spot uh, that allows countries to uh, derive maximum benefit from their relationship with the United States without sacrificing the benefits of a relationship with China is kind of what countries do. It's the path of, if not least resistance, it's the natural course. It can be tricky, particularly when uh, each government in the two big capitals takes a zero-sum and, in fact, a scorched-earth approach to their bilateral relationship and, co and cooperation by third countries. So if the U.S. strategy on, say, Huawei is expanded beyond uh, that issue set and applied more comprehensively, um, we will be in the position of doing the thing that every Asian government, every Asian commentator for as long as I've been in the business has said don't do, which is force us to make a choice uh, between the U.S. and China. Um, they, all countries, including Japan, want to have it both ways. And mm. there are you know, huge incentives to try to thread that needle. Does that put Japan at risk of running badly afoul of the U.S., particularly in a Trump administration? Yes, but like you or I would do in similar circumstances, there's a lot of feeling their way forward. And 
to be honest, there's also a, a not inconsiderable amount of dis dissembling. Um, you know, oh, it's, oh, that, who was that girl I was at dinner with? Oh, she's nobody, you know, uh, don't worry about it, honey. Um, so, but I don't think that it is, uh, that, the, that the challenges, and the Chinese uh, Communist Party imposes real penalties uh, itself on third countries that are too cooperative with the United States. Uh, so there's plenty of this going around, but I, I don't think that those pressures, either from Beijing or from Washington, are going to change the incentive structure, which is mm -hmm. um, find a way to work the middle. Mm -hmm. Let's take uh, two or three questions uh, together uh, in the interest of time. I see one question. Anybody? Yes? One here, one here. Okay, three. Start in the back, and then one, two, three. Ah, thank you. I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant, and actually Hopkins alumnus. Uh, in your talk, you uh, pa you mentioned in passing the uh, uh, the settle the Comfort Woman settlement of a few years ago. Yes. Uh, there was a Korean speaker uh, uh, here in town a while back who uh, said that. Uh, that that their feel that at least his feeling it's feeling of some people uh, in Korea is that uh, the U.S. Uh, behind the scenes uh, strongly uh, pushed for that agreement or encouraged that agreement between uh, the two parties, Japan and, and South Korea, and that then in in after the fact when it blew up completely and so sort of, uh, that that their feeling is at least this is what he said. We'll never again let the U.S. push us into an agreement which we are never enthusiastic, enthusiastic about in the first place. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm just wondering, in retrospect, uh, you know, looking back on it, uh, did we, did, did the U.S. do everything it could, sort of, in, right at that point, or okay. was there something we could have done otherwise? Thank you. Second question. My name is Tony Kane. I'm a retired academic, and my question is actually to look forward on the same relationship. Well, if the New York landlord does raise the rent on both parties, might that lead in the future, do you think, to some moderation in the tensions between Japan and Korea? Okay. The HNS uh, expenses. Yes, Ambassador Dim. Hi, Russ Deming, Retired Foreign Service. Hi, Danny, thank you for really an excellent presentation. I hope it finds its way into print at some point because it's really an excellent, excellent potential article. My question is, um, you pointed out how well Japan has filled the void left by the retreat of Jewish leadership in East Asia. But we've been blessed with a very strong prime minister who I guess tomorrow will become the longest serving yes. prime minister in Japanese history. And Shotaro uh, Yacho, bureaucrats and politicians, a very great combination of of talent. This charted a, a very strong leadership role for Japan in the region and managed the U.S. very well. Our Abe's term is due to end uh, next year. Um, after Abe, could, is there likely to be a great gap in leadership? Can, will Japan fall away just because of these combination of personalities and talents will no longer be there? Three very interesting questions. Great. Well, let me start with Korea uh, and Japan and the, uh, in 2015, I guess, the Comfort Woman Agreement, um, but then subsequently the Jisomi Agreement. Um, first of all, this is a tragedy that is breaking my heart because um, bolstering the uh, willingness, uh, the resolve, and the political space for both Japan and Korea to cooperate and cooperate with the United States uh, was a big part of my life and a major objective. Um, I think mm. that the mm. crux of the answer to the question you didn't quite ask, which is what did the United States do to uh, bring help bring about the, these uh, agreements, um, is not that we dragged Park Geun-hye and Shinzo Abe into a corner and knocked heads. I'm not saying there was none of that, but wasn't it? Um, we didn't mediate. Uh, we didn't dictate. But we 
definitely and deliberately created an environment that incentivized cooperation. Um, and that is not uh, more than a matter of creating a shared vision and a shared focus on common threats, on what is really important. And I think we created both forward momentum and a kind of tailwind uh, behind a cooperative strategy to safeguard our shared political security and economic interests that uh, caused the leaders on, in both capitals to conclude that it was worth taking the political risks associated with these kinds of processes and agreements. It was, with, it was worth giving the other side a chance, maybe even the benefit of the doubt, taking some tentative steps, and those tentative steps gradually snowballed, and the two sides discovered that there actually was some space to reconcile the irreconcilable differences. They wanted to find a way forward. I'm not suggesting it was an e that it was easy. There were plenty of setbacks. And yeah, there were times when uh, the fact that the South Korean leadership understood clearly how the United States was going to react privately in most cases, but eventually publicly, to a decision to erect another comfort woman statue here or there, or a decision to attend the spring rites at Yaskuni Shrine, um, that wasn't nothing. But the essence of what created an environment that made the Comfort Woman Agreement possible and desirable, it was their agreement, not ours, was uh, this sense of common purpose and the importance of uh, collaboration. Uh, I mean, whether it is um, host nation support or special, me you know, special measures agreement, whether it's funding the alliance or whether it uh, is these historical legacy issues, um, brute force isn't going to carry the day. Um, the U.S. can't just power through uh, politics in uh, com countries like Japan or South Korea. Um, on the historical issues, nobody's ever going to win a who started it first argument. I mean, you can go back to Hideyoshi, but you can go back further than that, I have no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, the discussion that has to be had is, where is this taking us? Where is this going? And where do we want mm -hmm. to go? I think that same template applies not only for the historical issues, but it applies very much for practical alliance support issues. Absolutely every US government has uh, pushed for Japan, South Korea, NATO allies uh, to do more in their own defense. No question. We want that. They ought to do that. And that's a, a rock we keep rolling up hill. But the rationale and the, and the character of that um, additional funding or additional effort by our allies matters a lot. And the rationale has not, has, can't be or I will kick your ass, or I will impose tariffs on you. It has to be in service of something that we are all agreed needs to get done and get done better. And moreover, if you look at the increase in the Japanese defense budget and the character of the increase, by and large, um, it's significant, number one, and it is also targeted. So I think you know, one of the key questions on host nation support ought to be, where do we actually want Japan to be spending its defense dollars? Shouldn't it be in complementary mm -hmm. capabilities that augment what the alliance collectively can do and that enable the US to 
rely in a sort of tag team partnership on Japan to do certain things and us to do others? Do, do we really want to gouge the, you know, the Japanese defense budget and so on and, and take funding away from valuable programs that enable new roles for Japan that are of value to us and have it go into more construction fund, more you know, electricity and labor. So it doesn't make a lot of <laughs> sense to me. Moreover, um, these are democracies and there are real politics in both countries. And the last go round in the US South Korea SMA negotiations with all of the sturm and drong and shoes pounded on tables and threats and demands for 150% or greater increases, ultimately generated two things. Number one, an, a roughly eight or 9% increase, which just so happens to be about the same increase as the US had negotiated in a normal amicable, I won't say amicable, but a normal way five years earlier. Um, but it also netted a long-term toxic pit of resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, clearly that resentment is being given voice uh, in Korea and we're at risk of sowing the seeds of a, n a new era of pushback, if not anti-Americanism mm -hmm. in other allied countries, including potentially in, in Japan. Um, on your question, Rusty, I would say that leaders matter, and the character and the personality of a leader uh, matters. But I mentioned some of the structural changes that we've witnessed in the way that Japan approaches uh, national security issues. And those structural changes, are, I think, are, if not permanent, certainly long-lived and will uh, outlast the incumbent, Shinzo Abe. Um, I also think that just as broken taboos politically in the U.S. may create uh, more space for future U.S. presidents to do things that no previous U.S. president would have contemplated, that um, the sort of role model, uh, the example and the traditions of Japan and the Kante of the past six plus years um, are more likely than not to kind of set a standard for behavior. That said, you know, if there are um, internal battles within the LDP, uh, or if there is a you know, if the Japanese political system gets sideswiped, uh, as it almost did by, um, I don't know how to characterize them. I served in Osaka uh, when Hashimoto was uh, mayor, or was, uh, governor, rather. Um, but by an uh, extremist sort of political element, sure, anything is possible. And as I've said in my remarks, we don't have to turn the Wayback Machine too far to get to a period of real disarray and problem, not only in Japanese politics, but in Japanese policy. Um, but uh, I think I'm on balance um, more confident than not that uh, what we have seen is likely to be the template for what we will see. I know that we could go on and on. And uh, I think the best thing would be also because there are many friends here. There's many people who would like to talk to uh, Secretary Russell personally. Um, we have some coffee and uh, refreshments and uh, we don't have, we won't have a lot of time for a reception, but everyone is warmly uh, welcome to come down and we'll meet in the next room. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been a memorable afternoon. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you for having me. Thank you.